Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Click to subscribe Believing Beings and press the bell icon to get notified about new videos. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله السميع من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. Dear brothers and sisters, I have an exercise for you to start. إن شاء الله تعالى. You know, over the last few nights, I've been covering different elements of the journey that we have in this life. And I've been starting off with a visual in most of these lectures. And tonight, I want you to actually think about something. I want you to imagine writing an autobiography. What would the title of your autobiography be? So go ahead, take a few seconds, inshallah ta'ala. What would the title of your autobiography be? And don't be lame and put your name. <laughs> Think about it. Title of your autobiography. You wrote a book about your life. Let's say that you're 80 years old, you're looking back, what's the title of your autobiography? It's actually a really, really good exercise. Anybody want to volunteer? Yeah. My sins, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Change it to my repentance, bro. <laughs> this is the good side. Autobiography is how you overcame. But no, uh, why did you choose that? It's because I believe uh, there is less to know about myself other than what I did wrong and how I think before I did So there is less to know about yourself, about what you did wrong, and how you overcame that before you left this world? Jazakallah khair. Anybody else? I'll take one more. It's always really introspective. Yeah, you. You guys look like your friends, right? Brothers, mashallah. All right. My uprising. Beautiful. Intifada. You're trying to get me in trouble. Got a Palestinian on stage saying intifada. All right. Uprising. Why am I uprising? Why? So you've, you've been over time through a lot and this, there's a massive uprising. All right, I'm going to take your brother too, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah. Don't tell me you forgot it. Don't say the downfall, uprising the downfall. What's your, what's your autobiography titled? Does my name have meaning on this? my name Muhammad? Allahu Akbar. Man, that's beautiful. Does my name have meaning to me? Because his name is Muhammad. Does my name have meaning to me? SubhanAllah. Beautiful. I already know what you mean by that, so I don't have to ask you for an explanation. Dear brothers and sisters, as we're thinking about this idea of your autobiography, this is a powerful exercise about how you write your life story. Because there's something very interesting about the way we function as Muslims in terms of our mindsets. We always put the conclusion and work backwards. We always put the conclusion and work backwards. When we talk about our lives, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, in the afterlife, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي جَنَّاتٍ وَعُيُونَ أَخِذِينَ مَا آتَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ مُحْسِنِينَ كانوا قليلا من الليل ما يهجعون وبالأسحار هم يستغفرون وفي أموالهم حق للسائل والمحروم الله سبحانه وتعالى says verily the muttaqin people of conscience people of piety اللهم اجعلنا من المتقين اللهم امين may Allah make us amongst them people of taqwa are in gardens and springs and rivers and trees and palaces they're in jannah Allah is giving you the scene Allah is giving you the end giving you the conclusion the scene 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَخِذِينَ مَا آتَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ They're getting exactly what their Lord promised them. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ مُحْسِنِينَ They used to be people of excellence before. Then Allah describes the actions. كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِّنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ They used to sleep little at night. وَبِالْأَسْحَارِهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ And then before Fajr, they would spend that time making istighfar. وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ And then in their money, they used to spend upon the one who asked and the one who was forbidden. Meaning the one who was not able to ask due to circumstances or otherwise. Allah gave you the conclusion and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moved you right back to what it looked like in this life. Meaning try to picture yourself as a person of Jannah looking back at this dunya and then consider the worth of this dunya. Try to look at yourself standing on the day of judgment and then consider the value of the day that's ahead of you. Look from there and consider that your ultimate conclusion. This is our success, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, as a group of believers that are celebrating the righteousness that led us to that place. I knew this day was coming. I was ready for it. And then when we think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, the very first page of Yusuf alayhi salam, before Yusuf alayhi salam saw the bottom of the well, before Yusuf alayhi salam saw the temptation, the lady that was throwing herself at him, before Yusuf alayhi salam saw slavery, before Yusuf alayhi salam saw the rotting inside of a prison cell, Yusuf alayhi salam saw a dream. It starts off with that. The story of Yusuf alayhi salam starts off with the final chapter. When Yusuf alayhi salam says, Ya abati inni ra'aytu ahad ashara kawkaba wa shamsa wal qamara ra'aytuhum li sajideen my, my father, I saw the stars. I saw 11 stars prostrating towards me. Wa shamsa wal qamar And I saw the sun and the moon prostrating towards me. So it starts off with the dream, the end. This is the final chapter. Now let's talk about how we got there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives you the story of how we got there. Because you start with the conclusion. When we talk about the life cycle of this ummah, we have an explicit detail where Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, will return. Where Ad Dajjal, the Antichrist, will rise from. The events that will unfold in the last days of this world in precision, in precise details. We know locations. We know the conversation between the Mahdi and Isa alayhi salam when Isa lands and he comes to pray behind Mahdi. And Mahdi takes a step back and says to Isa alayhi salam, you lead. And he says, no, no, you continue the salah. We know all of this in precision. And we could speak more about that than we could about the months to come the events to come as a life cycle of this ummah. We know more about the last days than we do about the next days. The conclusion. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala on a personal level, when he was going through his tribulations, going through his trials, when he was slandered by a filthy man, whose name was also Ahmad, but he was anything but praiseworthy, anything but Ahmad, Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad. And he would say, he would torture Imam Ahmed. And there was a time, or he led to with his slander, the torture of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah. And there was a time that Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad would be welcomed into the palaces of the, of the rulers. And he would be welcomed into the highest gatherings to speak about Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal radiallahu ta'ala anhu rahimahullah. And Imam Ahmed would say, Bainana wa baynakum al janaas. Between you and us is the day of the janazah. Between you and me is the day of the janazah. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah had maybe the largest janazah in the history of our deen. Millions of people came from all over to pray janazah on him because of the benefit that came from him. Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad was thrown away, cast away, a nobody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the end of Abu Lahab in the beginning of the call of Islam. How powerful is that? How powerful for the Prophet to be standing on a safa 
and to be calling the people to Islam. And think about how humiliating in the worldly sense of a circumstance this seems like. No one responds to you after you've been honored, after you've been loved. No one responds to you. They look at you like you're a weirdo. They look at you like you're a madman. And he's standing on Safa and he's calling upon his people. And his people love him. Just a minute ago, they were testifying to Al-Ameen. You are Al-Ameen. We trust you. You're this, you're that. Lavishing praise. And now, pin drop silence. And the mockery and the murmurs start. And Abu Lahab stands up proudly. Says, Tabbanak. I can't even repeat the word, subhanAllah. Curses the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Humiliates him. And Allah reveals the conclusion. Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tabba. Ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab. Sayasla naran that lahab. وَامْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ فِي جِيدِهَا حَبْلٌ مِّن مَّسَدٍ Allah gives us the conclusion from that time. Allah reveals the exact, precise punishment of Abu Lahab in the fire. And the same words are used towards him. When Imam Ahmed said, بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ الْجَنَازِ between us and you as the funeral. Look at the Prophet ﷺ when he left this world and look at Abu Lahab. SubhanAllah, Allah humiliated him even before he left this world. His body rotted, a filthy corpse. He was cast aside and no one wanted to see him out in any tribute. Gone. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ's death was the greatest tragedy. If you walked into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, and you knew nothing about Muhammad ﷺ, you would say, what a great man. How much he must have moved these people. Allah gave us the conclusion of Abu Lahab early on. Because it's the last chapter that matters. And sometimes it's important for us, just like Yusuf السلام, was given his dream early on. Just like Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, had that foresight. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforted the Prophet وسلم, with the conclusion in the very beginning. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about our celebrations in Jannah as if it's a conclusion that we can count on. Should we invest ourselves in that fate, in that eternity? Once you start from that point and you look backwards, then everything falls into place with the journey. Everything falls into place with the journey. The Prophet ﷺ, and he did this in multiple ways. Sometimes in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ drew lines. In one hadith, he extended his neck to show the difference. And in one hadith, he took two stones. The hadith of Abdullah ibn Buraydah, and he threw two stones ﷺ. And he said, do you know what these two are? And they said, what? And I want you to imagine this is one and this is two. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that this is the human being. This is his ajal. This is the date of his death. This is his amal. This is the hope that he had in life. And he stood between them, according to some of the explainers of that hadith. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This gap that I'm standing in doesn't exist. This is a part of life that you thought would come that never actually came. You had hopes in it, but you died before you could realize it. And the idea was that every single person in the graveyard has some level of unfulfilled hopes. But what's the cure for that? The cure for that is instead of having lofty hopes in this life, let all of your hopes be after this point. If you're storing your hope for this point, this is a certain transition point in your life, in your existence. And I'm intentionally using the word life. This is a certain transition point in your life. And if you've stored your hope for here, then you will find it in a way that is greater than what you could have ever hoped for. But if you store your hope here, and you're counting on this, the date of your death, not coming too early, then it will be disappointment here and it will be disappointment there. Store your hopes, your amal 
for that part of your journey, not for this part of your journey. That part of your journey is certain. This part of your journey you're unsure of. It could be tomorrow, it could be in 10 years, it could be in 20 years. You don't know. But remember your autobiography, and I hope you all have the title for your autobiography, and I look forward to reading some of them, inshallah. Write the conclusion. Write the last chapter. SubhanAllah, one of the beautiful things as we've been going over over the last few nights is the connection between the beginning of the Qur'an and the end of the Qur'an. And that's all I've been, SubhanAllah, looking at. Some of the first verses and some of the last verses. Last night I asked what's the first dua in the Qur'an and it is اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. At the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us those heavenly verses, and the entire Qur'an is divine, those verses that were given to the Prophet ﷺ in the highest of places, and they allow us to elevate to the highest of places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us at the end of those verses, وَعَفُ عَنَّا وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَارْحَمْنَا أَنْتَ مَوْلَانَا فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ Forgive us. Have mercy on us, pardon us. You are our Lord. Grant us victory over a disbelieving people. It was a request for a nasr, a request for victory. Because there is success on the individual level and there is victory for the ummah. As for the believers, we already said, Innal muttaqeen fi wa uyun. Verily, the muttaqeen, people of piety, are in gardens, springs, rivers, palaces. They're in paradise. They're looking backwards. They were people of taqwa. They perceived a moment that has now come to reality for them to where they can see it and feel it. And Allah says in the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Hudan lil muttaqeen. This is a guidance for people of taqwa. You will not benefit from the Qur'an or access the Qur'an unless you are willing to abide by the Qur'an and unless you are going to try to experience it in a way that you become aware of the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you and you live your life in accordance with that sight of Allah upon you. And then Allah talks about victory for the believers. And Allah says about the victory of this ummah. وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Victory, the ultimate victory, belongs to the believers, to the muttaqeen in specific, people of piety. So the end of Surah Al-Baqarah is an ask for an nasr, an ask for victory. What does the Qur'an end with before the mu'awwidat? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ The help of Allah has come. SubhanAllah, think about how powerful that is. When the help of Allah has come, when the victory of Allah has come to you, and the conquest has come to you. And you start to see people embracing Islam in large groups. Declare the glory of your Lord and seek his forgiveness and he is always accepting of repentance. It started off with a request in the beginning of come. Now what do you do? And as Ibn Abbas ta'ala explained that this was the death announcement of the Prophet You've written the conclusion of your life on this earth. This was your ultimate conclusion of life on this earth. As an ummah, you are bound for victory. As an ummah, you are bound for success. As an ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you great things. And even if you don't live to see the glory days of this ummah, know that you are a part of a glorious ummah. And so long as you were part of the process of bringing back that revival and glory, you will have the reward for that revival and glory, which is destined for you as an ummah. Destined for you as an ummah. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started off with the story of Adam alayhi salam, the first person mentioned in the Quran by name is Adam alayhi salam coming down from the heavens and then making his repentance and achieving through that repentance 
a higher level in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than, than he was before. Because tawbah actually elevates a person. As Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah describes so beautifully, he said that when Adam alayhi salam was expelled from paradise, Iblis was happy. He was pleased. But what he didn't realize is that when the diver goes to the bottom of the ocean, يَجْمَعَ اللُّؤْلُؤْ He gathers the pearls, he gathers the precious gems and stones at the bottom of the ocean. And then he rises up once again. So the first person mentioned to us in the Qur'an is Adam alayhi salam coming from paradise to this world. And the mistaken bare eye might see that as humiliation. But instead, he comes down only to gather the best of this world and to rise to a higher position than he was in the first place because he repented to Allah. The last person mentioned in the Qur'an is Abu Lahab who had the opportunity to rise like Adam salam, but chose, but chose the lower way and hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was explicit with his descent from this world into hellfire. You were put in this world with the opportunity to ascend like Adam salam, but should you choose to descend like Abu Lahab, that is a fate that you have chosen for yourself by your actions. And you cannot overpower the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not wrong you with his will. It starts with this story. It ends with this story. It starts in Surah Al-Baqarah with a request for victory. And it ends with the announcement of victory for the Ummah. Always start with the conclusion. And then come back to where you are. Where you're supposed to be. And ground yourself in that conclusion. And write your story in accordance with the conclusion. Now subhanAllah. Some of us can't see past surface level. And it is a miserable existence. And I say that and I feel sorry for people. I feel sorry for people. It is a miserable existence if you don't believe that there is anything past that grave. What a miserable existence if you think this is it. What a miserable existence if you think it ends with this doesn't end with this. And what a beautiful existence. What a beautiful existence if you merely see this as a bus stop, as another stop in the station. What a beautiful existence if you are able to appreciate and show gratitude for all the blessings that you have in this temporary world. Hence, your happiness grows, your pleasure grows, your contentment grows, and you don't even believe that this is the abode of happiness. Because you know that there is a much more vast abode where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you with something should you stay the course. But the difference is not in the existence of this space or the existence of this space or the existence of this space. Two people could be standing in a graveyard and looking at a grave and feeling entirely different emotions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to broaden our vision. And when we see victory and defeat, even in the worldly sense, in the material sense, only by the externals, we're not able to think of a proper conclusion because we can't see past chapter 3. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks to us in Surah, in surah Rum, when Allah Azza wa tells us about the battle of the Romans and the Persians, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the prophecy through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of a change. Something's going to happen where it's all going to change. It's all going to flip. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about those people who can only see surface level. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِّنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Allah didn't even say they know the life of this world. They're not even experts in the life of this world. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِّنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا They only know surface level of this life. They only can see the very outward surface level of this life. And they're even more heedless about the hereafter. With the hereafter, they're completely heedless. They have no idea what they're talking about, no clue. They're completely blind to the hereafter. And when it comes to the matters of this life, they only see outward. They can't see deeper. They can't see past surface level. The surface literally being that grave. How can they write a conclusion when they don't even believe that that part of the book exists? How can they write their story properly? 
if they don't even know where their story extends to? How can they begin to envision another life if they only know this fraction of the journey? Dear brothers and sisters, when we think of our journey of life, we're not just talking about our life of this world, we're thinking about our journey of existence. And subhanAllah, nothing can possibly make sense to us not our ease or our hardship, not our material victory or our material defeat, not our ummah successes or failures or our individual successes or failures without the afterlife. Nothing of it could make sense. Nothing of it could give us any form of tranquility. Nothing of it could give us any form of ease unless we see the end. Unless we see where we're going bi ta'ala. And so I come back to this, dear brothers and sisters, and I said, write your autobiography. Write the title. What's the conclusion? What's the last chapter? I want you to think of the day of your janazah. Are there any debts that are unresolved? Are there any people that you've hurt that you haven't sought forgiveness from? Are there prayers that are still there to be made up? Are there obligations that you need to do? If you were to have a heart attack right now and your phone was in your hands and you felt like you only had two more minutes to live, what would you start trying to delete from your phone so that when it's recovered after your death, it's not found? How many people would be able to say that you help them? And it's not quantity. I want us to get away from this idea that legacy is merely determined by how many. It's not about how many, it's how deeply. Wallahi, if you served your mother, if you served your brother, your sister, your father, if you served your grandparents, if you served your neighbor, and you did it with ikhlas and sincerity, Rasulullah said, I saw a man strolling. This is the conclusion of the man's autobiography. If he was to write his autobiography, it would probably be the man strolling in Jannah. Rasulullah said, I saw a man strolling in paradise because he removed a branch from the road. And Allah granted him a stroll in Jannah, a garden in Jannah to stroll in. His autobiography title would probably be something about that. The woman who gave water to the thirsty dog. It's probably her autobiography title, right? What would it be? How, if, if that's the level of ajr, of good deeds, if that defined those people because of how one of them treated a dog and how another one treated complete strangers by removing something harmful from the road, what about if the people that are closest to you in life could speak about how deeply committed you were to them and how you touched them and how you helped them and how you were the best of children, the best of spouses, the best of neighbors to them, the best of friends to them. That's all you need. That's all you need. Those witnesses on the day of judgment to bear witness to your character. But you put your janazah in front of you and you say, that's how I want it to be. You write your last chapter now and say, that's how I want it to be. SubhanAllah, when you think about the images of Jannah, when the companions used to sit with the Prophet wasallam, they were a people of certainty. And sometimes they were weathering the most difficult of storms. And when they were sitting with the Prophet wasallam, and he was talking about this other world, this other realm, they didn't have doubt in the existence of that other realm. And when you're in the ditch of Khandaq, when you're in the ditch, facing death, starving, but you have in front of you a man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who's speaking about endless lands and vast gardens and fruits and joy and his companionship and the companionship of the prophets and the righteous of old and those to come, then that ditch is no longer a reality to you. That ditch is merely a footnote in your book. Sometimes, subhanAllah, when we can't see past our trials, our trials become the dominant story for our book. But to the believer, our trials can become footnotes in the book. 
because they can become the things which propelled us inshallah ta'ala to creating that reality by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we needed so badly to get us through the moment. Your Jannah is waiting for you to build its houses. Your Jannah exists right now. You plant trees in Jannah right now. You have rivers that flow for you in Jannah right now. You choose your companions in Jannah from now. This is a reality that you are actively working on right now. You're in the construction phase. You're at work. What type of house are you building there? There is no home for you to find in the hereafter except for the one that you used to build here. What are you stepping into? What keys are you using? It's your moment now, inshallah ta'ala, to build your hereafter. And I want you, inshallah ta'ala, to do this with yourself, to sit with yourself, write the concluding chapter. Write the conclusion of your life and say, Ameen. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you husn al-khitam. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you a good ending. You know, I'll share with you a personal story, subhanAllah, because there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that a person will be doing the deeds of the people of hellfire until they can just reach out and they would enter into hellfire and then they do one of the actions of the people of paradise and so they end up in paradise and vice versa. Vice versa is also true. That a person would be doing the deeds of the people of paradise until they're right about to get into paradise and then they do one of the deeds of the people of hellfire and they enter into it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that fate. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, subhanAllah, first of all, that person, you know, the ulama mentioned we should not have su of in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a bad assumption of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, suspicion of Allah. So you mean I was good my whole life and I was sincere and exerting myself and then it just got taken away from me? No. This is not what this is speaking about. It's fima yadharu linnas. It's a person who was showing off. They were wearing the clothes. They were embracing the deeds in public. They were masquerading as the people of paradise. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stripped that costume from them before they passed away and they ended up of the people of hellfire. May Allah protect us from being of the hypocrites. Allahumma ameen. The opposite though, you see someone who's a person destined for hellfire, right? I mean, they're doing the deeds of the people of hellfire. They don't have iman. They don't have any of these things. And then subhanAllah, right before they pass away, they do something good and you go, oh my God, subhanAllah. How is it that this person lived this whole life disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then one week, one month and you start to realize Allah in His mercy saw something good in that person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw a good characteristic as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala mentions it was a good khuluq because we're made up of akhlaq and deen religion and character they had some good akhlaq, some good qualities, some good characteristics that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved about them and so they were given the deen, they were given the right creed, the right way, right at the end to where all of those good qualities suddenly passed through the filter of acceptance and they found themselves through the gateway of paradise. And I actually was sharing with some of my closer friends. I had a family member, subhanAllah, didn't used to pray, didn't used to fast didn't used to do any of the deeds that were necessary from an obligation perspective. And subhanAllah, something about him, he hated backbiting, hated gossip. I mean, he absolutely hated it to the point that when you started to talk bad about someone, he'd wave you off. He'd actually tell you to be quiet. So calm, so dignified, so beautiful, he used to say to myself, subhanAllah, if only he had the deen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him literally in the last few months of a lifetime of over 80 years and it was one of the most beautiful endings that you would see of a person. You say, subhanAllah. I was giving a khutbah about Zakaria alayhi salam. And I said he made dua and he was in his 90s. And he is calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his 90s with a whole lifetime. You know, we see the conclusion of Zakaria alayhi salam, right? The life of Zakaria is not in the Quran alayhi salam. 
but he calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with over 90 years of obeying and worshiping Allah. We're only seeing the ending, the concluding chapter, right? As far as this world is concerned. Imagine walking into Masjid al-Aqsa and you see a 90-year-old man in the corner making dua and saying, Ya Rabb, grant me a child. You'd say, that's strange. That's odd. But he's calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child. And he says, وَلَمْ أَكُمْ بِدُعَائِكَ رَبِّ شَقِيَّا You've never deprived me in my dua before, O oh Allah. I've been making dua to you my whole life and I never felt deprived by you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him with a miracle. And you haven't seen the 90 years prior to that. And wallahi, there was an old man who was sitting in the masjid, weeping. And I said, what's his story? He came up to me. He said, I'm 90 years old. I have a whole lifetime of sin, not a lifetime of good deeds. Do you think God would accept me? I said, of course he would. And I gave shahada to a 90-year-old man. You imagine a 90-year-old man taking shahada? Haniyallahu. <laughs> How amazing. 90 years of sins forgiven in a less than 90 seconds. Vanishes. And he didn't live much longer. Subhanallah. You think that's random? Put the conclusion in front of you that you want. You don't know what twists and turns are coming in the chapters ahead. You don't know if there is a well or there is slavery or there is prison. You don't know if there is the death of a loved one ahead of you. You don't know if there is an unexpected beautiful gift ahead of you. You don't know if there's a career hang up in front of you or Allah pr propels you to your wildest dreams when it comes to your material success. You don't know what's going to happen in the chapters in between. But don't put your hope with the grave here, the ajal, in this part here, which is between your ajal and your amal, between your, de your date of death and your long hopes, don't put your hope here where it doesn't exist, where you might not live to see it. Put your hope after the hereafter. Put your hope in that realm, and you will find meaning and fulfillment in every moment that you have in this journey because you're investing in something that is certain, you're investing in something that is real, you're investing in something that you will enjoy, you're investing in something that you will experience, and bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, you and I will experience it with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al-Firdaus al-A'la in the highest level of paradise because the Prophet sallallahu said when you ask Allah you know, when you make worldly calculations you be a little realistic, right? I don't know, I'm, I'm, how could I apply for this job? How, how could I apply for this job? How can I apply for this Jannah? The Prophet sallallahu said when you ask Allah don't just ask Allah for Jannah ask Allah for al-Firdaus al-A'la ask Him for the highest level because you're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes sincerity. May Allah make us sincere in this journey. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us steadfastness upon it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to arrive in Jannah al-Firdaus. Jannah al-Firdaus together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us around our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al-Firdaus al-A'la. May Allah allow us to find our loved ones there in al-Firdaus al-A'la with us. May Allah allow us to celebrate in that place together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for any shortcomings along the way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide through us rectify our hearts and rectify other hearts through us. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.